you from New York City on our flagship station, Q1043, and of course our great network of radio stations across the country and online outlets that bring you this show each and every week, like our good friends at UPK in Marquette, Michigan, AAF in Boston, KWKR in Garden City, Leota, Kansas, and IBA in Madison, Wisconsin, Rockin' 1017 HMH, Minneapolis, St. Cloud, and many, many others. Uh, great to have you guys all on board and tuned in with us each and every week. As always, keep up with everything going on with this show on my Twitter account, at Eddie Trunk, or in the Trunk Report section of eddietrunk.com. As we kick off our second hour of our three weekly hours that we have together, uh, looking forward to welcoming this guy to the show. It's been a little while since we spoke to him. He joins us now live on the phone line, guitarist from Def Leppard, Vivian Campbell. Viv! Good evening, Eddie. How's it going? It's going okay, man. More importantly, how's it going for you? Because for people who haven't followed the story all that closely, I was very sorry to hear the news that uh, you announced earlier this week that you have been diagnosed with cancer. So how are you doing? I am doing very well, all things considered. i got to say the um, treatment's going great, and I'm looking forward to uh, getting out and doing some shows this summer with Leopard and Lost in Lane. Well, you know, I was telling the audience, Vivian, before you called in earlier in the uh, in the show that I remember talking to you about six, eight weeks ago. We spoke on the phone because you've mm -hmm. been wanting to come on that metal show for a long time. And I remember talking to you. You were uh, doing the Vegas residency at the time, and you were like, I can't do it this time. I'll explain soon. There's something going on. I assume this is what was going on, right? Indeed. I think it's a legitimate excuse. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'd say so. But, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to getting on the metal show sometime in the future, if you still want me. Yeah, of course we do. But tell me how this happened in terms of when you found out about it, what exactly is going on, and what your symptoms were. Um, I have Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, it's a kind of blood cancer. And um, what alerted me to the fact that something was amiss was uh, pretty much exactly a year ago. Uh, we were starting. We were in rehearsals for, for the Def Leppard summer tour. And uh, I developed this cough, and it just wouldn't go away. It, you know, some days it was more pleasant than others, but for the most part, I was coughing 24-7, and uh, I just went to see doctors, and they couldn't diagnose what was going on until they actually had a look at my chest and realized that I had enlarged lymph nodes. And um, <clears throat> so I, um, I got my diagnosis actually just before we started, when we were in rehearsal for the, the Vegas shows this past March and April. And um, so then as soon as those shows were finished, I, I started my uh, chemotherapy treatment. So I'm uh, just just over two months into the chemo, and um, it's going remarkably well. i got to say I feel so much better. Actually, since the first chemo treatment, I stopped coughing, and uh, I definitely feel like I have a lot more energy as a result of that. So obviously there's a lot of side effects from doing chemo, as I'm sure a lot of your listeners know, um, which is one thing that's actually really uh resonated with me as a result of going public with this is how many other people suffer from cancer of different shapes and forms you know it's um it's unfortunately a very prevalent disease so yeah. um, anyway but um i've been very very touched by all the the love and support i've had via my um facebook page and via the deaf leopard facebook page and the last in line page so um you know it's uh it, it's good to know you're not alone well, yeah, I mean, I thought it was, was good that you did go public with it because I think that others that are going through it could kind of maybe find, you guys could find some mutual strength and, and very much a community. I mean, you're right. Uh, it's way too common. I mean, both of my parents are cancer survivors, uh -huh. and uh, it's, it's you know, I mean, you don't, there's hardly anybody that anybody knows that hasn't dealt with it directly or, you know, an immediate relative. So uh, I think that, you know, it, I would assume that it's good to kind of reach out to the community and, and talk to other people that are fighting the same things you are and, and the different experiences they're having with whatever the treatment would be. Well, certainly you, you can, you can uh, gather a lot of strength from that, you know. Um, for me, I mean, I, I did kind of want to not go public with it at first because uh, it is a weird kind of thing. You've got to kind of learn to deal with it on your own terms before you can you know, ad address the rest of the world about it. So, you know, I I feel very comfortable going public about it. Um, you know, for the first couple of months, I, I even tried to keep it from my children because they were still in school and doing exams and stuff, and I didn't want to add to their concerns. But, you know, after a while, it, it's inevitable that you, you know, something's going on and, and you have to kind of 
uh, come out with it and, and kind of explain what the situation is. But um, I, I'm, I'm very comfortable with it. You know, I'm very comfortable with the treatment. I'm very comfortable with, with how it's, uh, my body's reacting to it. Um, you know, obviously, it's done a number on my hair. So I'm, I'm a bit more Joe Satriani these days. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping that means I'm going to play even more notes like Joe. Um, well, that's but, the least of your worries. <laughs> that can always come back, you know? Yeah, yes, indeed. So, uh, you know, but um, it, it's all good. You know, I, I have no issues with it. I'm, I'm, I'm perfectly at, at peace with it all. So. Struggling with a cough, which you said was your major symptom, I mean, that had to wreak havoc on you in Def Leppard because, as everybody knows, with the harmonies in that band, and you're a big part of the singing, it must have interfered at times with the live show, right? It, it did, actually. It was difficult because, you're right, we're singing, we're on the mic every song, so um, I actually had to keep, keep turning and looking at Rick Allen, and, you know, people, I think, thought... We're thinking maybe I was just rocking out with Rick, but I was actually coughing up alone the whole time. You know, it was very uncomfortable, and it just got worse and worse towards the end of the tour last summer. And it was it was kind of pretty bad when I was in Vegas too. I mean, I had some days that were more tolerable than others, but uh, you know, a lot of people noticed it too. You know, I, I know I wasn't fooling anyone with it, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that that part is gone. At least you know I, I can breathe a lot easier now. And and now I'm now essentially I'm dealing with the chemo and not with the cancer. I'm pretty sure I've knock the shit out of the cancer at this stage it's just dealing with uh, the side effects of chemo you know Viv did this and of course we'll talk about a few other things as well but did this was there any history of this in your family at all no this is an idiopathic disease there's no rhyme no reason for getting it it, it strikes anyone it doesn't have anything to do with your lifestyle or your diet or your ethnicity or your genetic makeup or anything and uh, in fact normally it, it strikes people younger uh, usually in their 20s and their 30s um so, yeah, there's just there's no reason for it at all. It's just kind of it was a random thing. Yeah, I mean, that's what I learned about cancers, because there's some that are obviously hereditary. Like my dad is a colon cancer survivor. So as a result, I get screened every three years just because yeah. that is something that's very hereditary. My mom survived a, a very rare form of leukemia. And that was the, when that happened, the doctors were like, no, that's it's completely random. So you don't have to worry about there's no screening for that. Yeah. Yeah. So you learn a lot about this, whether through directly through you sure. coming forward or just having experiences with it that I imagine help you. I mean, what was your when you got this news? Were you floored? I mean, how did how did you handle it? Um, I no, I wasn't floored. I. I knew something was wrong, and I was just glad to find out what it was, to be honest, you know. I was glad that there was finally an explanation. You know, obviously, when, when your doctor says that you're going to have to do six months of chemo, you know, you immediately think, <laughs> that's probably not going to be fun. But, um, no, I, um, I've i taken it in my stride, you know. It's a bump on the road. It is what it is. It, it could could be a lot worse, you know, and there's a, there's a lot... There's a lot worse cancers out there, and I was very, very lucky to find it very early. So, you know, it's just a question of writing out the treatment, and um, it's actually been good for me in a lot of ways. You know, it, it's it's been a very uh, humbling experience, and it kind of helps you recalibrate and put the focus on what's important in life, you know. What exactly is the treatment? I mean, are you taking injections? Do you have to go to the the hospital on a regular basis? I mean, I, what are you doing exactly? Yeah, yeah, I go to my doctor's office uh, approximately every every two weeks, and they hook me up and uh, drip chemo into me for about two or three hours. And is it? it do you, have you had real besides the hair loss? Have you had? Really, what, what are the major side effects? You being sick to your stomach and things like that? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's uncomfortable. It hasn't been debilitating for me, you know, which is why I'm able to go on tour with with Leopard and with Last in Line this summer because it's it's not anything that that brings me to my knees where I'm puking twenty four seven or anything like that. You know, it's I, I do have moments of discomfort and nausea, um, bone pain and tiredness and stuff, but it's nothing that that's affected. Or at least I haven't let it affect my daily life. I mean, you know, I'm sitting here having a beer, to be honest. So oh, wow. <laughs> it's, you know, and, and I've had a full day. I've been up since 7 this morning and, and been out doing this and that and the other. So it's, um, I, I really haven't let it impinge on my, my lifestyle too much, you know. But, but that's maybe that's just me. I'm just an ignorant cunt when it comes to that shit, <laughs> you know. <laughs> well, is it, I was going to say, is is that almost more of a mental outlook? I mean, I mean, I know that... Uh, you know, this stuff can be really brutal to deal with in terms of the treatments. But, I mean, it sounds to me almost like 
your mental disposition going into it is like, well, I'm going to take this down. I'm going to not miss a beat playing with the band, and I'm even going to have a beer on the weekend. I mean, it sounds like that's probably pretty healthy in terms of your mental approach. I I, I do think so, yeah. I mean, you know, it definitely starts in the mind, and and I'm not of the mindset that I'm about to be sick. And I certainly have, have no intention of dying anytime soon. So, um, and they're uh, telling they're telling you that the the prognosis to to cure this, I think I read in your online statement was about eighty percent, right? Well, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, if you're going to have a cancer, it's the one to get. You know, it's it's over eighty percent cure it, and you know, especially when you catch it early, like I did, it didn't get to the bone marrow or anything like that. You know, um, so I'm really not at all concerned about it. You know, it's just a question of dealing with the side effects of chemo, as far as I'm concerned. So tell me about the touring plans then, because I don't know if Def Leppard has anything scheduled for America, but what is your what is your next move as far as playing? Um, I'm leaving for France on Wednesday morning. Um, we we start off, we have a, a brief European run uh, of shows starting at Hellfest in France next Friday, a week from today. So um, that's the first show, and then we have four shows in Spain, arena shows that we're doing with Whitesnake in Europe. And uh, <clears throat> then we have three shows in Scandinavia. That's one in Norway and two in Sweden. And i got to fly back to L.A. to do a chemo treatment for a day and a half. And then I fly up to Canada to rejoin the band. Two shows in Canada, and we have two on the east coast of America. And that's, that's it for Leopard for this summer. Wow, so you, you really feel you feel good enough and confident enough that you're going to be able to handle all that travel and, and, and doing that stuff, huh? I I am 100% confident I can do it. Yes. Wow, that's a that's remarkable, man. Good for you. Um and and then, you know, I know that uh, we had Rick Allen, he's coming up on that metal show. We had him in there this season and so he believe, was, yep. Yeah, he was telling me that um he he and the band had an absolute blast with that Vegas residency and kind of led us to believe that there might be more that's coming somewhere down the line, I guess. Well, it, it was a lot of fun. I'd, I'd say the, the most fun part of it was, was being dead flatbird, being our own opening act. Right. Because we could get out there and just, you know, there were there were no rules as regard to what dead flatbird played, so we were playing some uh, really early leopard stuff. All the stuff that I probably pester everybody exactly, to hear. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> stuff, stuff for anoraks like Eddie, yes. <laughs> um, so, I mean, but that was great. It, it's, it's very refreshing for us to play something other than pour some sugar on me. You know, yeah, you can yeah. understand yourself. I mean, we're we're sort of between a rock and a hard place. We have sure. to play the hit songs, and, and we're very fortunate that the band has those hit songs to play, but, you know, it, it's it's a lot more fun for us to get out there and do something obscure, so, so we got to do that, um, which was a lot of fun, you know, and, and and actually to break the show up into two parts was was very theatrical too, so that adds a lot a lot to the excitement level for us. When I saw online some of the songs you guys were doing, because if people didn't understand what happened, Def Leppard came out as their own opening act when they did the residency in Vegas, and you played all these deep tracks, early tracks, obscure tracks, and when I saw that stuff coming through online, I mean, I was so pissed that I didn't get there uh, to see it, because I was, you know, I was dying seeing that set list, but the way Rick made it sound, it, it probably will happen again at some point, so that would be good to see. I would hope so, yeah. Have you guys talked about or worked on any new music yet? Um, we've done a lot of talking about it, that's for sure. Um, and we've even done a little work on it. Yeah, we, we started a song when we were in, in Vegas. Um, it, it's just difficult to get us all together, you know. As you know yourself, we're, we're kind of scattered geographically in terms of where we all live, and it's um, it's difficult to get us all on the same page at the same time. And, and when we do get together at work, it's always for another purpose other than specifically to do a record. I mean, we haven't scheduled time to do that for many years. And at this stage, we are long, long, long overdue having some new music. You know, it's kind of embarrassing, actually, but uh, but we, we've started something at least. Well, you're an Irishman living in Los Angeles, and Joe's an Englishman living in Ireland, so right. I would think that you would be, if anything, pushing to either do the record in L.A. or in Ireland so you could go home for a little bit. Well, I'd certainly rather do it in Ireland. I'm, I'm not in L.A. by choice. I mean, I'm here because my, my children live here, and as soon as they go to college, I'm I'm getting out of Dodge. <laughs> um, I'm not saying I'm going to go back to Ireland specifically, but, uh, <clears throat> yeah, L.A. is a strange spot, as you know, but... Um, Home is where you make it, you know, and that's where my kids are. So, um, but yeah, we have in the past when when Def Leppard did actually make albums. It is um, 
geographically beneficial for us to record it in Ireland, you know, for one reason or another. Yeah, and uh, I saw I saw a, a documentary on Thin Lizzy, and they went into Joe's house with Scott when they were remixing yeah, yeah. some of that stuff. And I saw in the in the video, Joe's looks like he has a nice setup there, so it wouldn't he be certainly does, yeah. wouldn't be a bad place. It doesn't look like that's for sure. Yeah. Uh, let me ask you one more thing uh, on another topic here, Viv, before I let you go. Um, you mentioned Last in Line, which for those that don't know, you're going to go out with Jimmy Bain and Vinny Apice and a singer and do material from the first two D.O. records, which, of course, you were a huge part of. Where does that stand? What's the, uh, what's the progress report there? Well, we actually had intended to do a three-week European tour incorporating a lot of festivals, but because of my chemo treatment schedule, we've had to curtail that seriously. So... As it happens, I mean, we're, we're fitting shows between my treatments, so we can only manage to do four shows. Um, they're going to be in the U.K. Actually, well, the first one is in Northern Ireland in my hometown of Belfast on the 8th of August. Um, so basically we have three, uh, three shows, three club shows, and one festival date in uh, the second week of August. Have you guys rehearsed? Um, a little bit. <laughs> Not a lot. I was just wondering for you, uh, how how does it did it feel to revisit, you know, music that is you know thirty years old and and such a huge part of how people discovered you as a player, but you know for a long time you kind of moved away from that and and embracing it again for and, and did you have to relearn and and re listen to it to remember what you actually did? I, I actually did. Yeah, I mean, I didn't listen to those records for decades. For, for one reason or another. Um, so, I, yeah, I've, I've literally had to go in and relearn it. Um, I specifically want to play my guitar solos as they were on the record or as close to as possible because that's the way that people have been listening to it for 30 years. So it's going to be in people's DNA, and that's what people are going to want to hear. So um, it has been a bit challenging for me to go back and relearn my original guitar solos because even when I was with Dio, I don't think I ever played them exactly the same live. Um, I was always a bit haphazard with regard to how I approach recording guitar solos. Um, so they're a bit sporadic. They're a bit challenging to, to relearn, but it, it's been good for me. Um, it's been a really good exercise, and I'm getting back into playing my guitar again, um, which I would blame on Thin Lizzy. The stint I did with Lizzy in, in 2011 really kind of reignited my passion for for shredding again so um that's kind of what led to me calling jimmy ben and vinnie apathy and, and claude Schnell to see if they wanted to get together and play so it's been fantastic i mean I, the first time we actually got in there and played together it, it sounded really 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 tight like it was 90 something percent there we could have done a gig that night you know um it just kind of comes back to you so and, and the all-important question is tell everybody about the singer because he's got some big shoes to fill um, yeah, we have this great singer, uh, name of Andrew Freeman. Uh, when I called Vinny and, and Jimmy and Claude to get together and play, I mean, it was literally just to do that. Like, hey, do you want to get together and jam? And we booked a rehearsal room on an afternoon somewhere in the valley here in LA and we went out and played. And while we were there, uh, Vinny actually said, hey, I know this great singer. He lives nearby. His name is Andrew Freeman. He sang in Lynch Mob when I played with, with George Lynch. And, and I said, well, give him a call, see what he's doing. So, so Andy actually came down that very afternoon, that first afternoon we were playing. And he just he walked in, and he, he set up his little iPad. He had his lyrics on it, and he just started singing. And it, it, it gave me goosebumps. I mean, he doesn't sound like Ronnie. He doesn't have that tonality. And very few people do. And, and in, in a way, I'm, I'm grateful that he doesn't because I, I think it would have been weird to try and have a Ronnie clone. But he certainly has mm -hmm. the same power in his voice and he has the same passion and he certainly has a similar range. So he can hit the notes and, and he, he brings his own twist to it. So um, hearing Andy sing and just playing with those guys again, it kind of we, we sat down afterwards and we all said, well, let's, let's take a, st a stage further. You know, let's go ahead and do a gig or something. So well, one thing kind of led to another, and, and then we were talking about doing a tour, and then we decided to call it Last in Line, and here we are. We're actually going ahead and doing it. Talking live with Vivian Campbell. Um, Viv, you know, it's no secret, and of course it's spilled out many times publicly, that you and Ronnie had differences when Ronnie was still alive. And, you know, I wonder what has been the reaction from the fan base? Have you gotten a sense of... You know, I'm sure there's a degree of people that agree that those 
albums you were a part of are the definitive albums I do for one. Um, but obviously look at it a little bit cross-eyed saying, well, you know, this guy kind of, you know, distanced themselves and had this kind of, you know, sparring with Dio and now Ronnie's gone and now he's going to go out and embrace it. I mean, how do you answer that? And what is your, you know, what is your uh, feelings about that? Well, as far as I can gauge, I mean, opinion is, is kind of impassioned one way or the other, which is good. I mean, I'd rather people care than didn't care. I mean, people either seem to be very passionately in favor of it or very passionately against it. You know, there's very few in between. Um, you know, for those who, who actually embrace the music for what it was, I mean, those songs were not only recorded and played by Vinny and Jimmy and myself, but they were also written by us. You know, I think a lot of people forget that, you know, that we were very, very much a creative part of, of those records. Um, and, you know, I, I think people have to approach it with an open mind. I mean, I, I do regret a lot of the things I said about Ronnie, and I'm sure if Ronnie were alive, he would sit down with me and have a beer and shake my hand and you would probably apologize for wishing me dead you know it's um it was an unfortunate situation i um wanted to distance myself from that music and from that organization because i was very unceremoniously fired from that band and then in the years afterwards it was portrayed by ronnie and wendy dio that i had turned my back on the band that I had left the band, which couldn't be further from the truth. Um, I was fired in the middle of a tour um, for me and for only asking that, that Ronnie and Wendy fulfill a promise. Actually, Ronnie fulfilled a promise. Wendy didn't knew nothing about it, but um, so... Can, can you reveal what that promise was? Well, the, the, when we first met on, on the very first night that, that the Dio band formed, it was in a rehearsal studio in North London um, in... October 1982, and it was Ronnie and myself and Jimmy and Vinny, and we hung out and we played, and that that was the birth of the band. and And Ronnie kind of explained to us that that um, he didn't want to be a solo artist; he wanted to have a band, but he was going to call it Dio for a number of reasons. Number one, for name recognition, because he was a celebrity; he was a star, obviously. Uh, number two, he had an existing record deal at the time. Um, and he kind of explained to us that he wanted us all to contribute creatively, which we did. Um, and he explained to us that by the third album, that through our blood, sweat, and tears, it would be an equitable situation. And, and that's I just held him to that promise come the third album. And um, apparently the promise was forgotten, so the result of that was I was fired. And that, that really did hurt me a lot because I, I did give blood, sweat, and tears to that band. I wrote those songs with Ronnie. Um, I, I, I give it some of my best years and I, I worked for nothing practically. I worked for less than our road crew. Um, anyone who was in that band at that time will tell you that our road crew got paid more than the band did because we believed that we were working towards something that had been promised to us. Um, so it was an unfortunate situation and it really, really hurt me. So for many, many years, I wanted nothing to do with the music. I wanted nothing to do with Ronnie or Wendy Dio. And as a result of that, I, I did lash out and I did say some things that, that perhaps were a little bit harsh. Um, you know, and as regards some of the comments that, you know, I disliked heavy metal or whatever, it, it, it's true that I like music. It's, it's, it's also true to say that heavy metal and hard rock and guitar music is, is not my staple musical diet. I mean, to me, music has always been like food. 